Hey guys, really excited to worship with you guys this morning. We just wanted to give you guys a few general updates. Um, and just so you know, if you want, you can go on our website and sign up for our newsletter, which helps you keep in flow with the rhythm of what's going on in our church. For example, this past Christmas holiday season, we got special content and I knew exactly when it was happening, what was going on, um, and it just really helped me know uh, what to expect. So once again, sign up for the newsletter or talk to your R3 leader for more announcements. But yeah, for now, let's get started. Facebook is a great way to stay connected. For me, it's a great way for me to stay connected with people who aren't in my R3. I've even met some people who I've never seen before through comments and engaging in posts. If you haven't already, follow Trinity Life page that is different from the community page it's the trinity life page make sure your notification settings say follow otherwise you might have liked the page and not see any posts but yeah like trinity life page at Trinity Life Church, we love telling stories of how God is moving in our community and in our city. Every week we've been telling stories of how God has spoken to us and how we've obeyed. And it's been so inspiring for me personally. It always moves me into a posture of worship and just awe. I'm amazed with how God speaks to people in so many different ways to accomplish his mission. And it's been such an honor and a privilege to hear your stories so thank you so much for submitting your stories. They have been so inspiring, not just for me, but for many people. But we want to hear more, guys, more. Let's celebrate Jesus. Let's talk about what he's doing. He is speaking to us all the time. And I know you guys are obeying too. So send those stories to hear and obey at trainingalife.ca. Um, and let's celebrate Jesus. I'm so excited to hear more, guys. I don't know about you guys, but last year when the pandemic hit, it was really hard for me. I had a hard time processing my emotions and just trying to figure out how to navigate through that time, let alone thrive in it. That's why I was super thankful when Trinity Life came out with the marriage tip videos and also how to share your faith during social isolation. It taught me so much and helped me navigate through the rest of 2020. Um, if you guys haven't seen any of these resources and this content, I would recommend you subscribing to the YouTube channel. It has amazing resources and there's so much that has come out from then till now that really could help you benefit you during this time um, and maybe even your friends. So yeah, subscribe to the Trinity Life Church YouTube channel. Have you been wondering what your purpose might be? Or maybe, why are we here? What is my destiny? Or maybe you just really wanna connect with people. Well, our R3s help with all of that. Um, our R3s are here to help you discover more of who you are, why you're here, and then together, how we can make a difference. Recently, I had a conversation with someone in my R3 about how it's just amazing that over this year during the pandemic, not only were we able to grow closer to each other, but we were able to grow closer to God and grow as people. It's amazing what this R3 has done for me during my dark days and my brighter days. I really want this for you too. So get in an R3 today. It'll help you grow with your relationship with God, grow in deeper community, and even show you how to influence society for the common good. Instagram is a way for me to connect with people, but also with organizations and causes that I believe in. I really do believe that it's a great way to come alongside organizations and further the common good, which is the kingdom. Um, I really do believe that Trinity Life Church is doing amazing things, not only in our city, but in the world. Follow Trinity Life Church on Instagram to be part of this movement today. One of the best gifts about technology is that I could take a sermon from four years ago and then listen to it again. And then I can pause and write notes and I can pray and ask God questions and then send them to my friends and have discussions. It's such a gift. And we have sermons from the last 
eight years, which is amazing. You can go on YouTube, Spotify, you can have um, podcasts. It's amazing what we can do with technology. And I will tell you from firsthand experience, God has spoken to me through sermons from the past that are different to how they apply to me today. So go back, listen to some messages, and it will make the biggest difference for how you hear from God. Parents, Sundays at 11 a.m. is the Kid City time. Get your devices ready and our teachers will be ready to teach our kids how to hear and obey right at 11. Guys, personally for me, watching my son Ethan grow over the last couple of years have been such a blessing. Um, just the other day, he invited me into his room to pray with him, which was so precious to me. I know a lot of this has to do with the discipleship that he's received from the teachers that have invested and poured into him over the years and I'm truly so thankful. So parents, um, if you're new to our church, here's a video to show you more about what Kids City is about. Hey parents, do you wish that your kids had a strong community? Do you want to see them change the world for the common good? It all starts with them learning to hear and obey the voice of God. Our passionate teachers would love to come alongside you as your child explores community and faith. And best of all, they will have a blast. Activities include music, dancing, and so much more. Your child has a destiny. Join us as we discover it together every Sunday at 11 a.m. through Kid City. Hey church, we're so glad you're worshiping with us this morning. We're glad to be together again. Mm -hmm. And I'm here with Missy, my wife of almost 17 years. And uh, we're going to celebrate marriage this morning as we talk about uh, you live what you love. Mm. And so again, I'm Mike, this is Missy. We're leaders yes. of Trinity Life Church. And uh, now it's time for you to invite. Yes. So Make sure to share this out. We talk about it every week, but it's so important. Share out, um, share this live stream, use that invite button. And we make it super easy for you just to be able to click on it and do it nice and easy. You don't even have to, it's really just this. We're working, you know, finger, <laughs> or, finger, reversal, yeah, or that, whatever, however you. Oh yeah, I can see you on your phone. Yeah, this yeah. Mouse, well, I don't know. Thumb, finger, either way. A touch screen. Yeah. <laughs> Siri, maybe um, Siri can do it for oh, you. Oh, then you don't even have to move. You can just sit there. Or, or Alexa. But, we not want you to be moving. We don't want you to be static right now. We want you to be moving. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Um, we want you to be moving. We want you to be um, engaged. So whatever Definitely. you need to do, um, just share it out so that um, anybody who sees this that's that's really that's really looking for community and may not even know it um, has the opportunity. So yeah, that's what and guys, we create. It's Valentine's Day, so we should be used to sending invitations uh, on Valentine's yeah. Day, right? Right? Uh, but, I mean, growing up, like, who who really likes Valentine's Day? I mean, let's... It's terrible. Yeah. I've actually never, I've never loved this holiday. It's yeah. just made up. It's, it's, it's a Hallmark holiday. Yeah. Fake holiday. <laughs> uh, we've never really celebrated Valentine's no. Day. Um, it's like probably the worst night of the year to go out. Not that oh, we yeah. can do that now. Right. Uh, but, um, yeah, Valentine's Day, I always, I always hated it in school growing up because, um, you know, you're worried if you're going to get as many invitations and candies as somebody else's. Yeah, they call them invitations. Awkward. Is that the right word? Um, no, not invitations. What do um, they call them? Declarations of love. <laughs> I don't know. That's bold. <laughs> you were getting that in like I elementary never, school? <laughs> no, I, I don't. I, I don't never got any I of those. No. No. Um, um, what do they call them? No, just little Valentine's, like just little cart. Like Valentine's. Cards. Valentine cart, yeah. They're called Valentine's. <laughs> they're called Valentine's. Ah, uh, yes. Ah, <laughs> uh, yes. It's calling them invitations. invitations. It's all good. <laughs> Valentine's. Yeah. Um, yeah, and, and then, you know, you'd buy them for your class or whatever. Yeah. Our girls actually go to a school where they don't do that. that so it's kind great. of like. A rule like you yeah. don't, we don't, you can't don't do talk it. about Valentine's Day because yeah, it's nice. just kind of made up holiday. And, and a lot of us, our understanding of love is majorly influenced, especially here for us in the West, yeah. uh, by 
this concept of Valentine type love. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, just very, very surface level y, you know. Right.、Um, yeah, I don't know. Feelings oriented. Yeah, yeah.、Uh, just yeah, type. totally emotionally driven, like, yeah. Um, which is bad, but one of the things there is this, like, also with a commercialized Valentine's Day is conversation hearts, right? So we have a pillow that represents one of these. I don't know why we have this, but someone gave, it, someone gave you, this to the girls. Well, maybe they want it in one of those claw things? I don't, I don't remember. Yeah, I'm not sure why we have it. This says hug me. Oh,、um, oh thanks. Thanks, I needed that.、Um, <laughs> no, but like, you get the little candy conversation hearts. Which one are disgusting? I don't know.、Uh, yeah, I mean, they're, they're just bad candy. It's, bad it's like candy. candy corn for Halloween.、Oh, it's just、yeah. like a waste. Yeah, that's a good, that's a good、right? analogy. Yeah. Or, or smart, oh, they're not, or rockets.、Oh, they're yeah. known as smarties、yeah. in,、uh, in the States, yeah, rockets, rockets here. here、yeah. What a waste of a candy. I know.、Yeah. I know you're going to hate me because some of you guys love rockets, but. It's okay. That's not okay. But <laughs> <laughs> what we're getting to with these is like, they're, they're called conversation hearts, right? Like you give, you give somebody, it says, love you or hug me or whatever it is. Yeah, what、And、are some other examples?、Um, I don't know. It's like kiss or something. I don't know what、oh, it is. Oh, yeah, kiss. Like kiss. Me yeah. Or, yeah. I can't think of any other ones because I haven't、me、seen、either. them in years. <laughs> yeah, they still make them.、Right. I don't even know. <laughs> We could be definitely dating ourselves here.、Um, but. What it is, is it's a very poor form of communication. Definitely. And, and a lot of us,、uh, when we're going to talk about marriage today,、yeah. uh, but, but hang with us because we're talking about marriage. You may say, well, that, that doesn't apply to me because、mm. I'm not married, or that doesn't apply to me because I don't want to be married.、Uh, don't worry, it will apply to you because marriage is a God ordained institution、right. that we either are in or we honor. Um, or you've experienced through someone else's marriage, through,、mm -hmm. through your friends, through your parents, through. And, and that's good or bad things, right? There's good and bad there. And the crux, the core of, of, of this is, is marriage is, the,、uh, is a very, maybe the most intimate form of, of community that God has ordained for us.、Uh, sorry, I didn't say intimate, it's the wrong word. Intense. Intense.、Yeah. The most intense.、Yeah. I don't want to say intimate because you can have friendships that are the most intimate form. You can have other relationships, a brother or a sister or a parent, that there's an intimacy there、yeah. um, that a、yeah. lot of people don't experience in marriage.、Uh, but I want to say the most intense form. And those of you guys who, who are married, you're saying, Yeah, yeah, that's yes. right. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is intense. Yeah.、Uh, there are ups and downs. There, the, it, it is a struggle. And guys, what, what,、uh, what the core of the struggle is, is this it's around conversation.、Mm -hmm. And on Valentine's Day, we, they, you know, they thought this is a cute idea to have conversation hearts. Yeah. To, to just give someone something to say, to say how you're feeling. Yeah. Something like that. But guys,、uh, in. In relationships, specifically in, in marriage here, but in all relationships, conversation and communication is so key. Yeah. Right? And we can't just give hearts to somebody to have them understand what we're saying, but a lot of times in your relationships, here's something, here's something that, that, that relates to the heart. A lot of times we, we would just say, Well, I hope you would know me by now.、Mm. I hope you would understand. Where I'm coming from. You should know better about it. You should know what I'm thinking. And when someone says that to me, I say, I can't know what you're thinking unless I hear you say those words. Now, sure, you can give me a conversation or to tell me to hug you. You, <laughs> you could write a, a, a note to me. Yeah.、Um, but you have to express what's, what's, in, what's in your thoughts. And as much as these fail, this is kind of a, represent, a representation of how we tend to operate in conversation. And、yeah. unfortunately, In our technological world, a lot of us have lost the art、mm, of conversation. That's so true. Yeah. We've, we've just,、uh, we don't know how to communicate anymore. We don't know how to、yeah. talk. And this, unfortunately, might be the best that we can do because it's something that somebody else wrote that we can say, hey, I,、yeah. I need this right now.、Yeah. And I need,、uh, I need you to hug me or、mm -hmm. something like that. Right, right, right. Using, or even cards, right? Like cards to say how we're feeling since we don't know how to. We don't know how to verbally express that ourselves. Not that the cards are bad. When cards, aren't, cards aren't bad. They can help along with that. But hopefully, there's more to it than just with, with 
in this type of relationship, yeah. right, that you want to express. So. so guys, as we worship this morning together, uh, think about how God loved us. And he loved us through a specific communication. He spoke, right? We hear from God. We say discipleship is hearing and obeying. And, and so we're, we're hearing God speak. He spoke creation into existence. Mm. Uh, the Chronicles of Narnia and, and uh, what's the first one? The Magician's Nephew, Magician's nephew yeah. has this amazing uh, scene where Aslan is singing yeah. creation into existence. Mm. All right, so, so God is singing. He's speaking to us. Uh, he, his, his word is written for us as well for us to understand. Jesus actually became... Uh, the Word in the flesh, or I should mm. say the Son of God became the Word in the flesh as Jesus, right? And, and, uh, and so there's all these different forms of communication uh, that are so important to us as you commit in a relationship. Because in our series, that's what we're talking about. We're talking yeah. about how do we love God? How do we understand God's love? How do we, how do we love others? How do, you, how do you love God and how does that flow out into loving your neighbor well? Right. Uh, we've talked about the Good Samaritan Pastor. We'll, deal, we'll, we'll go deep into that again. And remember, like, like we talked about last week, love is a choice. Mm -hmm. As you, you choose to communicate. You choose to take your thoughts and express them in words or in writing. You have to choose to do that. And, and uh, in, in the in uh, this passage, this series that, that we're in throughout this entire month, we're developing out this idea of love being a commitment and a covenant. And, uh, and when you do that, that means you're saying no to a lot of other options. Mm -hmm. So we'll talk more about that this morning in terms of relationships, in terms of marriage in particular, because whether you're married or not, whether you're aspired to be or not, uh, it's something that we need to protect and uphold as followers of Jesus. Right. So let's, um, let's kick off with some prayer. So join me as we pray and press into this idea and uh, just give, give God the glory as we start. Heavenly Father, you, you are the perfect example of how to love. You showed us what love looks like when you um, sent Jesus down. Um, mm -hmm. That's how you loved the world, your word says. And so... Um, we, we receive that this morning, and I pray that um, out, of, out, of our, out of, our inner, and of our inner being and our soul and our heart and our mind and our strength, we would see that love is this choice and that we would choose love, mm -hmm. that we would choose love for the relationships, for the people we come across, and however that may be, Lord, that, that they would see that the impetus behind how we act and react um, is love. And so show us how to do that this morning. Now may we just sing to you and give you the praise and the glory as our Creator God. We love you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amazing. Thank you, Mike and Missy. Now we're going to turn to the scriptures. We're going to read out of Luke 10, verses 25 to 37. And behold, a lawyer stood up to put him to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, What is written in the law? How do you read it? And he answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, You've answered correctly. Do this, and you will live. But he, desiring to justify himself, said, Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among the robbers, who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was. And when he saw him, he had compassion. He went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. 
And the next day, he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? He said, The one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, You go and do likewise. I love this passage, and as you are typing in the chat and putting in your favorite part, I love the care and intimacy that the Samaritan shows the man who was beaten. He gets down, he gets dirty. It says he binds up his wounds. That is very intimate. I could just see this man, he's hurt, he's aching every little move. He's aching, and the Samaritan just with such gentle, intimate care, picking up his broken body, wrapping him, sopping up the blood, wiping and washing away the dirt. He doesn't mind getting his hands bloody and dirty for those who would be considered even an enemy. And as we look to marriage, oh my gosh, that our marriages would be like that. Intimate, personal, willing to get down and dirty, to see each other clean and healed. God, give us a vision, a renewed vision, a new vision of you and how you are intimate, personal, loving, gracious, and that we would have no other, no other vision but you. I'm so excited to worship you this morning, Jesus. May the drums drum and the voices rise up this morning as the church gathers to see you. It's to you, Jesus, we sing.
us the God, the God of all the universe, the creator of the stars. You bend down, you stop on the road, you restore our dignity, you care for us, you heal us. Jesus, we look to you this morning, your bride in need of healing and restoration. We trust you. We trust you to be that for us this morning. And we pray this in your name. Amen. with 
courage to stay in your presence, to seek your Holy Spirit, to be consumed with this love for you, Lord. I pray that you would make us unhindered. As this song cries out, make us unhindered, Lord. I just, that's a big ask. That is a, that's not an empty statement. And I pray that over us. I pray that over Trinity Life Church in a real way, no matter how long it takes, God, no matter what boulders you have to move in our hearts to get stuff out of the way, I pray that over us. Sing with me, church. Make us unhindered. destiny that will empower you to live what you love and that that love will be defined by the God who created those stars and didn't leave you laying in the dirt but he breathed in life picked you up and released you to an eternal destiny. We pray this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Awesome. Thank you so much, worship team. We just sang these really powerful words that God bent down and picked up our hearts right out of the dirt. And you, you just have this, this, this is this amazingness of God, right? The God that created the heavens and the earth, which also give glory to Him, right? This, that's what the, the Psalms say. Um, the heavens, you know, decry the glory of God. Um, so this God, this cosmic God, spends time bending down and also picking up our hearts. You know why? Because He knows that we're fearfully and wonderfully made. There's this intimacy there with the Father. There's this care and this gentleness. And church, what if we saw our neighbors this way? How profoundly different would we would we use would we would we act around them if we cared for them in the same way that the Father intimately cares for us? Us oh, so beautiful. It's just such a beautiful picture of, of just it's like this child bending down to pick up a flower just tenderly you know and, and, and plugging the leaves and doing whatever in whatever he wants to do but just this care and intimacy of of the father here and how much he does 
love us and how he cares for our hearts. Just love, love, love that. Um, and guys, we're going to go through, uh, we're going to put the graphic up again for you. This week, I want you to sort of focus in on a little something different as you're thinking and meditating, contemplating um, on the graphic. Um, you'll notice that it has um, different languages and those different languages um, are what it what we're saying in the tagline like you live what you love so we want you to sort of see like this transcendence of love this multiplication of love and a really neat part about this is that the different languages that are represented are languages from our church like your heart language your, your native language um, so you may even see your own on the graphic but that's something that we want you to just take time to reflect on meditate contemplate um, as we as we tune our hearts to the sermon time so we're gonna do that um, we'll give you a chance to do that when the graphics up and why don't you pray with me now uh, let us pray father thank you for your nearness thank you for your closeness to us that you intimately care about the hairs on our head and just how you have gone down and and bent down and kneeled down to to pick us up and to show us who we are and to show us and give us our identity lord you are just an amazing god creator pray now that we would just focus in on who we are as your children and um, just live in that dwelling with your presence and in your spirit in this time it's in jesus name we pray amen Hey church, I love that graphic. Uh, I just hope you had just a great time of, of reflecting on it, of contemplating, of thinking, of meditating on it, of really looking at it like an art piece, because that's what it is. Because, because uh, th this week we asked you to focus on uh, the languages on there and how the love lights up these languages. So on there, you live what you love is translated in different languages and hopefully uh, you saw a language that's familiar to you on there as well, which is kind of cool that our church has all these different languages represented in it. And, and uh, so what it's supposed to depict there is that there's this transcendence and there's tr this transculturalness to love. And last week we talked about God's love and how we experience God's love, how we how we learn from God's love, how it forms us, how it shapes us, how it, how, how it has become the source of our vocation, of our calling. And so we love God uh, because we've experienced His love and, and we love others. And so today we're talking about what that looks like. And so you have their different languages uh, because loving your neighbor as yourself is key in this. That is the natural outflow of your vocation of God uh, loving you and you loving God and you loving others. Your natural outflow, the purpose of your vocation is to love others, is to love others. Well, uh, that's hard for us, just to be <laughs> frank. You, you have all these different languages represented and, and guys, pick a couple places in the world and pick two languages and you're gonna find a bunch of wars because people don't know how to love their neighbor. You have nations warring against nation, language groups who are warring against language groups. Guys, this goes all the way back to the beginning of Genesis and the Tower of Babel, where, where, where you have uh, language and dispersion and then wars and, and all these things. So, um, as we talk about loving your neighbor, we're going to focus on that today, on this verse, where the second part of the lawyer's response, to love your neighbor as yourself, and Jesus affirming that that is right, that, that you will live, that you will live if you do these things. But again, we all struggle with that. We all struggle with loving our neighbor. And then we're going to take this concept and we're going to specifically apply it to marriage. And we're going to talk about family and marriage and that relationship. Uh, but as we struggle with it uh, together, uh, I think the gospel writer here, Luke, he sets us up well for this because, in a, in a good way, uh, because he talks about the theme of humility leading up to this passage in, in Luke. And you may be saying, well, I don't have an issue with pride. 
which as C.S. Lewis says, it means you do have an issue with pride if you think that. So let's all kind of humble ourselves right now and hear from Luke here as he, as he puts together uh, this gospel for us, as he writes this, and, and he highlights, like I said, this, this theme of humility for us, of, of humbling ourselves. So leading up to this, in Luke chapter 9, you have this argument arise among the disciples. And their argument is, well, which one of us is the greatest? Which one of us is better than the other one? And that's not a very love your neighbor attitude here, right? They're trying to figure out which, which disciple is the best one. Uh, which one is Jesus like the best? Which one does he love more? And, and then after that, uh, well, you know, Jesus teaches them. Uh, he, he talks about uh, children, actually. And, and he says, whoever receives this child in my name receives me. Uh, for he who is least among you all is the one who is great. He, f- he flips it. It's an upside-down kingdom, right? And then, and then it goes on, and Jesus is going through, um, through the, the countryside, and he comes across a village, which we'll talk about that next week, actually. He comes across a village, and uh, the village rejects him. And James and John, the sons of thunder, they come up and they say, Lord, do you want us to tell fire to come down from heaven and to consume them? And of course, Jesus has to rebuke and correct them, train them in righteousness. And he says, he says, uh, no, no, that's, that's not what you're supposed to do. Let's, let's, uh, let's be humble here. Uh, and, and then you have uh, the return of the 70 or the 72 uh, that, that, go, that Jesus sends out and they come back. And they're so excited in this passage and in the early part of chapter 10, uh, the first part of chapter 10, they're so excited about it. They're, they're so excited that the spirits are listening to them, that the spirits are subject to them. And Jesus says, don't rejoice in that power. Rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Basically, rejoice in your salvation. Rejoice in the thing that you had no, uh, that you had no part in play, like that, that, you, that you did nothing for. You didn't do anything for your salvation. Rejoice in that. Be humble, guys. Be, be humble. He's, he's teaching his disciples. And then at the end here, right before this passage, starting in verse 21 and following, in chapter 10, we see Jesus blessing his disciples as, as receiving eternal, as they're receiving eternal things of God as little children. He's blessing them to do that rather than as those who are all wise and all understanding. He says, receive them as children. Have a childlike faith. Receive it that way. So humble yourselves, humble yourselves. And then we get to this passage where the lawyer, he says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus says, and, and Jesus says, well, what do you think? What does the law say? What is basically, what did I say back then? And, and the lawyer says, well, you should love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind. And you should love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus says, yeah, you've answered correctly and you will live. But here's the question. What if you don't love yourself? Jesus says here, the scriptures say, back in Leviticus 19 as well, love your neighbor as yourself. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. But what if you don't love yourself? What if you struggle with that? If you struggle with it, how can you love your neighbor? And I wonder if that's why so many of us struggle with loving our neighbor, because we don't know how to properly love ourselves. Now, before you, uh, uh, before you jump to any conclusions, um, some of you guys might be saying, well, yeah, I, I agree with that. We're supposed to practice self-love and self-care, right? Some of you guys might be saying, oh, that's just this um, modern psychobabble, all this stuff. Uh, and so let's, let's, let's frame this. Because apparently here, you can't love your neighbor unless you know how to properly love yourself, right? So we need to figure out how to do that. And and you're right, modern psychology, self-help gurus would would say it this way. They'd say, well, well, self-love is like this. Self-love is, uh, and this is a general definition that that you would find, self-love is a state of appreciation for yourself. It's a state of appreciation for oneself that grows from actions that support our physical, psychological, and spiritual growth. Okay, 
Self-love means having a high regard for your own well-being and your own happiness. Self-love self -love means taking care of yourself, taking care of your own needs, not sacrificing for the well-being, sorry, not sacrificing your well-being in order to please others. That's your general psychological definition of self-love, of self-care. And it's, it's, not, it's not all bad. It's, it's, it's almost there. But this is how God would say things. He'd say, well, you didn't even know how to love until I first loved you. And how did I do that? Well, I sacrificed myself for you. I gave all of me for all of you. And, and I did this by giving you my best. I did this by giving you my time. I did this by giving you my love. I did this by giving you my very self. God says that all through the scriptures. I gave you my very self. And so it's a little different from this self-love that says, um, maybe you shouldn't do that so much for other people. Because God says, well, no, that's exactly what I did. So then how do you love your neighbor as yourself if you don't love yourself? Well, first of all, listen to the sermon from week one. Second, I'm going to summarize it here a little bit. You got to experience God's love first. That is going to lead you to loving God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind. You give him your best because he gave you his best. You give him your time because he gave you his time. You give him your love because he gave you his love. You give him your very self because he gave you his very self. You give him your everything. If you can do that, then you can fully love your neighbor as yourself because in learning to love God, you've learned to love yourself properly. So see, guys, learning to love God, experiencing God's love and, and loving God, that's part of experiencing God's love. It's two sides of the same coin. We love God because He loves us, right? Experiencing that heals you. Experiencing that helps you learn how to love yourself properly so you can love your neighbor properly. And again, just to be clear, I said this last week too, but just to be clear, this doesn't happen like when you Figure out how to love God, then you love your neighbor. It's not linear like that. Don't segment it. Don't silo those things. It happens simultaneously, guys. We're not going to do it perfectly. It happens all together. We're learning how to love God. We're loving our neighbor all at the same time because one flows out of the other. And it flows out of us to others. And so essentially then, a rejection of neighbor love, those of you who are like, well, uh, okay, I, I hear that, but I can't love everybody, right? I mean, I can't, I can't love everybody. I can't love that neighbor. Well, essentially a rejection of neighbor love in practice or attitude is a rejection of God's love and your own need for it. So essentially you're saying, well, I reject God's love. If that flows out of that, if that flows into neighbor love, my love for God and the neighbor love, and I don't want to love my neighbor, well, I've, uh, you've rejected God's love and, and you've rejected your perceived need for it. And so that's why it's so important to start with the love of God, because you can't love your neighbor unless you start with the love of God. And you can't love your neighbor as yourself unless you properly understand how to love yourself. All right? So here he says, love your neighbor as yourself. And in verse 29, the lawyer responds, well, He's trying to justify himself, which we tend to do, right? <laughs> He's trying to justify himself. And so he says to Jesus, well, oh, and who is my neighbor? Who, who's my neighbor? We normally define neighbor as those like us, right? If you think about, um, or if, if you've ever lived in a suburb, uh, everyone, if you're in a neighborhood, everyone has the same house, you know, or similar house. Uh, you know, you have... Um, similar family structures, similar uh, pet structures, similar car uh, cars, right? Like, if you live in a neighborhood where, um, you're not going to live in a neighborhood where everyone drives a beat-up old pickup truck and your neighbor has a Lamborghini, right? That's a different neighborhood, right? You're, you're, you're going to be in a different neighborhood then. So, 
typically you're going to be, there's going to be a lot of similarities. So we think, sometimes when we think of neighbor, we think of those who are like us. Uh, but uh, here's an example in real life, my next door neighbors. My next door neighbors on this side and this side, and then if you throw us in the middle, we're all completely different. <laughs> I mean, our family, our family structure is the same here, but they have a different, uh, the, the, the next door neighbors to one side of us. Um, even though family structure is similar, well, uh, their, their jobs are totally different. Um, uh, their philosophy of life is totally different. Their faith is totally different. Their religion is totally different. You know, all, uh, we, we, there's, there's so many different d distinctions there. Neighbors on the other side of me, um, their whole lifestyle is, is totally different. Uh, they actually look like they belong, uh, they, they actually don't fit the rest of our neighborhood actually because it's more, uh, it, it just looks different than them. So here, when we think about neighbor, I don't just want to think, us to think about people who are similar to us or who we want to associate with. And I think uh, the lawyer, when he's talking about this here, when he says, well, who's my neighbor? That's what he's thinking. He's like, well, yeah. I love my neighbor. I love the rabbi. I love the scribe over there. I love my fellow lawyer. I love the Pharisee. I love, I love, um, you know, uh, you know, Bartholomew from Bethsaida, whatever. I, I, I love these guys. They're, they're all my neighbors. But Jesus, we're going to find out next week when he starts to tell the parable of the Good Samaritan, he's like, well, this is actually your neighbor. Do you love this person? Right? And, and so when we think about neighbor, uh, what about the criminal, right? What, what about the person who insults you or who berates you or who sabotages you at work? What about the person who has made racist comments to you, whether directly to you or on social media or, uh, you know, a figure, a public figure who does it? Uh, what about the person who has abused you? What about the dictator in another country who murders, rapes, extorts. How, how, how do we love that? Are we supposed to love that neighbor? Are, are they our neighbor? Well, what about the person who uh, has taken something from you? What about the person who threatens to hurt you or a family member? Are, are they our neighbor? Are we, are we supposed to love them, Jesus, like we love ourselves? What about uh, the person who just gets on your nerves? You know, a lot of you guys probably have that. Uh, and, and so we're not talking about big things. We're talking about little, like the person who just gets on your nerves, who your personalities clash, who just annoys you. Now, are, Jesus, do we really have to love them like we love ourselves? What about your spouse, who you've been in a continual argument with for years? Do you have to love them like you love your neighbor? What about your family member who you had a, an argument with uh, who you have a brokenness with, who you had a rift with years ago. How does this work out for them? Are we supposed to love our neighbor then, Jesus? And so, when we talk about loving the Lord your God with all your heart, when we talk about loving your neighbor, marriage is actually, and family, is actually a very good place to start. Because Yes, here's the reality. If we can't love those in our family, how can we love our neighbor? And if we can't love those in our church family or the larger family of God, how can we love our neighbor? Right, who's different from us? The, the things that we just talked about. Gene Vaith says this in his book, God at Work. He says, the family is the foundational vocation. The family is the foundation of vocation. It's, it's where your vocation, where you, where, where you loving God and loving neighbor actually foundationally is lived out. So if you have an issue with your brother or your sister or your mother or your father or your, your spouse or your children or your grandparents or your aunts or your uncles or your cousins, you have a crack in your foundation. And if you have a crack in your foundation, Eventually, you're going to have cracks in the walls of your house. Eventually, you're going to have cracks in the floor. Eventually, you're going to have cracks everywhere else. Eventually, it's going to crumble because you've built your house on the sand, not on the rock. You haven't heard Christ's words and obeyed them like he says in, in, at the end of the Sermon on the Mount. And if the family is a foundation of vocation, this means that you're to live out the love of God 
there. That's to be your foundation. And, and marriage is here because uh, in talking about marriage on this Valentine's Day, um, which, like Missy and I said earlier, we've really never celebrated, uh, but in talking about marriage, marriage is the most intense form of community that we've been called into in this, on this earth. Um, now, it's a spiritual commitment as well. It's not just an earthly one, but it is not an eternal one either. Right? That's why I say an earth, it's, it's on this earth. And here's the truth with uh, marriage <laughs> a lot of times and, and many of our relationship decisions, I should say. Uh, this is from cultural commentator David Brooks. He says, he says, everybody spends too much time appraising the other person when making marriage decisions. But the person who can really screw things up is you. He says, the person you should be appraising is yourself, not the other person. He also says marriage is a 50-year conversation. I love that. I love that. You know, we talked about the, the hearts earlier, the conversation hearts, and you know, what it says on that. Uh, if that's the extent of your conversation, that's not going to be a good 50-year conversation. The person you marry, your spouse, the person you want to be in, people you want to be in a relationship, you should... Uh, you should ha- be able to have conversation that's so stimulating with them, right? Because in marriage, you've committed to that, you know, and he uses 50 years, but he's just using that as, an, as a, a big number, right? Because that's kind of the, the, the big one. Um, that's, that's huge, right? You're committing to something really big there. And if you're aspiring to be married, or if you are married, are you ready for that commitment? Did you realize that was the commitment you stepped into? Some of you guys can't even commit to an R3 or to serve, other, or to serve others or serve on a team or, or, or anything like that, but you've made this huge commitment into a 50-year relationship conversation or more, right, in your life. Are you ready for that? Guys, if you don't love your neighbor as yourself, here's, here's, uh, this will be a little bit of a confusing statement that I'm about to make, but, but bear with me. If, if you don't love your neighbor as yourself, you'll never be able to love a future or present spouse as yourself. So if you're aspiring to be married, if you think I might be married one day, if you, don't, if, if you haven't experienced the love of God and you aren't, and you aren't uh, loving God and then loving others, that isn't flowing through, that isn't your vocation, that isn't flowing through you, that's going to be a really hard 50-year conversation for you with that spouse. That's when marriage is really hard. When the love of God isn't defining you, the love of God isn't defining them, the love of God isn't flowing out of you and into them. And if you don't, if you aren't able to love your neighbor as yourself, you will never be able to do that. And then on the other side, if you are already married, if you don't love your spouse like yourself, as Paul says we should do, uh, you'll never be able to love your neighbor as yourself. So there, there's that side of it too. You're already in this foundational family uh, sphere of vocation. And so if you don't love your spouse as yourself, you'll never be able to love someone outside of that yourself, your, your neighbor yourself, because you can't even do that with the neighbor who's closest to you, which is your spouse. Because you can't even do that with the one who, is, uh, who loves you the most in this world, which is your spouse. So how are you going to do that out in the rest of the world? So if you're already married, well, then you better start right there with your spouse. Not with your kids, with your spouse. And start there. If you're aspiring to be married, Start with neighbor love. Start with neighbor love. Because you will never be able to love a spouse the way you should without it. Here's the reality for most of our relationships, guys. When suffering happens in one of those relationships, that moves our neighbor love to a, a harder commandment, a more difficult commandment, the commandment of loving your enemy. Because when there's a rift in a relationship, when there's an argument, that person is automatically now against you, right? Again, we talked about rival schools last time. They're, 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 that person is against you. So they become your enemy because they want this and you want this, right? Conflict happens. 
which if you're married, you know conflict. Conflict happens a lot. It's, it's, it's two people becoming one flesh. Conflict is bound to happen. But if, you're, if your uh, purpose is neighbor love, and you're living out that vocation of loving God through that, it's going to make it so much, so much easier. But when this happens, we struggle with loving that person who's against us. And, and, and that actually reveals our true nature, it reveals your true identity, it reveals your true character. That's when character really comes out because you're not thinking. Character, character comes out when you just react. Character doesn't come out when you've had time to think and process and then you move. When you react, that's when you see someone's true character because that's what's underneath the surface. And, and this, is difficult. Uh, this is difficult for us because our relationships aren't actually defined by God's love. Many of our relationships aren't defined by this agape, this Greek word for God's eternal love, this, this love that is perfect. Because a lot of our relationships, think about your marriage, or think about your boyfriend, girlfriend right now, are not defined by this God love. They're defined by a lesser mortal love. A love that isn't the love of First Corinthians 13 that says love never ends. It's a love that does end. It's mortal. It can be killed by conflict. It can be killed by your enemy having someone against you. And it changes the way you view that person. That's not God immortal love. This is a mortal, human, natural love. And a lot of our relationships, let's be honest, aren't defined by God love. They're defined by this love that dies. Because when someone says something that you don't like at, at this church, your first impulse is to go to another one. When, when someone says something you don't like, your first impulse is to not talk to them anymore, is to block them, defriend them, just ignore them. Because, it, because those relationships are defined by a mortal love, not an immortal one. You haven't fully experienced God's love. You're not fully loving Him with all that you are. All right, so, so uh, for those of you who are aspiring to be married, for those of you who are already married, you hope to enter into, or like I said, you have entered into this, this very intense commitment. Um, and, and guys, guess what? Kids intensify it even more. Uh, but this earthly marriage is also a mortal relationship. It'll end one day. It's not forever, it's temporary. And like I said, sometimes it's defined by a mortal love, not an immortal love. So think about, so here's a question for you. Why do you want to get married? Why do you stay married? I remember when I was on my wedding day, someone asked me, why, why do you want to marry Missy? And, and I said, well, I, I love her. And uh, it was my youth pastor from um, previous years. He said, on my wedding day, like 30 minutes before I was going to get married, he said, um, you don't know what love is. And I was like, get out of here. <laughs> I was like, whoa, um, okay, thank you. Um, I guess I'll just process that later on my honeymoon, right? Um, and it didn't take long, long for me to process, actually. He's absolutely right. I had no idea what love was. I had no idea. I was just barely scratching the surface. I had this, I had this natural human love, and it's not bad. I had this, uh, what, what the Greek would say, an eros-type love, or a philia-type love, a friendship love, or an affection-type love, right? Like, I, I, had, I had that type of love, but I didn't know how to love Missy like I'd experienced God's love. And I don't even know if I'd experienced God's love that fully yet. And so I learned and I grew and five years later, I thought, man, I had no idea how to love her. Ten years later, I thought, man, now coming on year 17, I'm like, wow, do I, do I really know how to love Missy? I'm just still learning the depths of God's love here. The good news is, these lesser loves, we don't discard them. They help us experience the greater love, the immortal love. So instead of falsely dichotomizing uh, agape and eros or, or whatever, uh, James K. Smith, that philosopher I mentioned last week, he would say that agape, uh, this perfect God love, actually rightly orders our other loves. C.S. Lewis would say this, he says, 
He says the natural loves attain their perfect state in divine love. So we don't throw away our silver just because we got gold. We keep both, and it helps us put them into perspective. So you might be saying, well, that sounds great. That sounds good. That sounds like it could work. Uh, but you don't know what I've been through. You don't know what I've suffered. I can't love my neighbor because I've suffered so many things at the hands of, of neighbors. And you're right. I, I, I don't know what you've been through. And I'm really deeply sorry for the pain and the suffering that you've been through because that is not God's design for us. It's not God's design for you to go through this pain and suffering. Um, and, 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 and that would hinder you from experiencing God's love, from, from loving your neighbor as yourself. Uh, because something that really prevents us from realizing our vocation, this vocation of, of God's love and of loving God with everything that we are and of loving our neighbors as, as ourselves with all of our minds and all of our hearts, when that prevents this from happening is trauma. And generally speaking, there's two types of trauma here. Uh, one is when bad things are done to you or happen to you. And the second one is when good things aren't done to you or don't happen to you. There's, there's two types of trauma here, and I love how Jim Wilder talks about this in his book, Renovated, uh, where one is, is something bad was done to you. The other one is, well, they withheld something that was necessary and good for you, that you should have experienced. And for a lot of, and for a lot of you, that good, necessary thing that was withheld from you, not that there wasn't bad too, but that good, necessary thing that was withheld from you is God's love is experiencing his love, is, is uh, this invitation into God's love. And, and you have to open yourself up to God's love. You have to attach yourself to it. It's this attachment type love where, where psychologists say in attachment love, and you can look at attachment theory for this, you find your identity because it shapes who you are, it shapes your very character, it shapes the very essence of your being. And so when you attach yourself to God, the ultimate being, the ultimate love, it changes you, it heals you, it, it brings joy into your life. But you have to open yourself up to that to go through the trauma. Because when, you, when it starts to find who you are, it starts to shape how you live. And you start to live what you actually love. And if you don't open yourself up to God's love, you will never be able to love others fully. You'll spend your life looking for love in the wrong places. It'll leave you unsatisfied, empty, unfulfilled, leave you empty, broken, just always searching. And it's only love of God that will order all things properly in your life. God's love orders all other things. Here's a quote from C.S. Lewis out of his book, The Four Loves, he says this. He says, we may give our human loves the unconditional allegiance which we owe only to God. Then they become gods. Then they become demons. Then they will destroy us and also destroy themselves. For natural loves that are allowed to become gods do not remain loves. They're still called so, but can become, in fact, complicated forms of hatred. As when you sit in that trauma, when you sit in your brokenness, when you sit in your emptiness, when you dwell in darkness, that's what happens. Those, those misplaced allegiances and loves become your gods, and you replaced one god for the true god. You replaced this allegiance for your true allegiance. You placed a lesser love for ultimate loves. And they don't, they're not even loves anymore because there's a war and a battle. They just, they're just agents of hatred. But again, to remind you, Jesus says in here, we went from verse 27 to verse 29. Jesus says in verse 28, do this and you will live. You'll experience abundance. You'll experience this life that you're always designed for. You'll experience this transcendent way of living. He's, he's gonna, you'll experience a different quality of, of life. You see, whether you're in an earthly marriage or not, 
We're all in a spiritual one. All of us who are followers of Jesus, where he's the groom, we're the bride, and we're all in this marriage. And it was our first marriage. It was, it's the only one that matters. Which means our love for neighbor, our love for family, flows out of God's love. And then we can love with all of our heart, all of our soul, all of our strength, all of our mind, and love our neighbor as ourself. So then, loving others isn't something we do. It's something we are. God is love. And when God is love, like the Bible says, and your identity is in Christ, and you're formed and shaped by that identity, love isn't a chore. Love, loving others isn't a skill that you have to learn. Loving others isn't even a royal duty of a child of God. It's just who you are. God is love, so now you are love. So loving, loving God, it's not an issue. Loving your neighbor as yourself, not an issue. Loving your enemy, not an issue for the kingdom character. God's inviting you into that this morning. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for your example in this thing, for the simplicity of the faith again. Thank you for uh, this kingdom character and citizenship that you're building in us. And so do your work in us today. We ask that in your name. Amen. Wow, thanks, Mike. That was a, a lot to think about. Um, I want to invite you all, um, whatever position you found yourself in listening to um, that message, to stand and make, um, make a posture of worship uh, as we sing Breathe, which requires a bit of breathing room. So stand with us and um, let's worship. Um, Worship our great God, who loves us so intimately. I am found in your presence. I want you, Lord, I need you. Created for rest. Destined for joy, quiet my heart, clear out the noise. Ooh. 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 Breathe life on dry bones. I long. Thank you. 
we are found in your presence. We are found. Sometimes I think to think of you as my bridegroom and that I am your bride. But there is a safety there. There's a love there. I can trust you gave yourself up for me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And as so many look to try and define love, may that search lead them straight to the Father's heart. As so many look for love, may they start to set their eyes on you and your example. And may they release people to breathe for the very first time. And I know someone out there is thinking, I've been breathing my whole life. What's he talking about? God, show them. Show them that thing that only you can show them. And may that next breath be like none they've ever experienced. And as the church continues to worship and to respond, God, thank you that you are who you are that you love the way that you love, that no one else is like you, and that we, the church, rest and are found in your presence. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amazing, guys. Thank you so, so much. I just want to echo what they said there, that there is no one like you, God. And now we get to release you into your R3s where you can explore that even further. That when we're looking for love, we need to be going straight to the Father's heart. And so now as you're released, you're going to get to do that through different mediums, different ways, right? Through giving and communion and prayer. And this is part of community where you get to explore more of your relationship with each other and your relationship with the Father and what that looks like. And you get to dive even deeper now into the Father's heart and into His love. So I just want to bless you into that. I just bless you into the Father's love this morning uh, as you get to explore that together.